My name is Kate Ryan. I'm an Assistant Attorney General for the State of Colorado. My job is to assist Colorado's administrative agencies when they have any litigation concerning water rights. Water rights across the Western United States do vary from state to state. However, in general, they're governed by very similar principles. The prior appropriation doctrine governs the distribution of water rights throughout the Western United States. In the West, the climate is dominated by very low annual precipitation. This is very unlike the eastern and central United States where there's ample precipitation and so there are ubiquitous streams, rivers, and lakes. In those areas, the doctrine of riparianism controls. If a person or entity lives adjacent to a body of water, they may use that water. In the West, however, there are many people and entities who need to use water who do not live adjacent to water. When the population of the western states grew in the late 1800s, there was also a significant growth in conflict between gold miners who came to the area, as well as the original settlers who were interested in irrigating these lands. The federal government gave homesteaders 40 acre parcels to irrigate and to use for their farming. However, a lot of those 40 acre parcels were not adjacent to any water at all. So the people who came west discovered that they needed to construct canals and ditches to connect their lands to sources of water. The prior appropriation doctrine was the solution to great conflict. A shorthand way that many people use to describe the prior appropriation doctrine is saying first in time, first in right. The first person to come to a source of water, to divert that water and to use it for beneficial purposes, establishes through that use a right to use water. Those who come to the same source of water at a later date also acquire a right to use water, but their right to use water is junior to the senior or more early appropriator of water. Population of the Western states grew significantly, beginning in the late 1800s. At this time, there was intense conflict between gold miners in California, as well as farmers across the region, because water was scarce, many people wanted to use it. People who came west and were granted 40 acre homesteading rights at that time wanted to use water for their property. However, many of those 40 acre homesteads were not located adjacent to a source of water. Therefore, those farmers knew and they learned that they needed to construct ditches and canals to transport water from streams to their farms to irrigate their lands. Prior appropriation was the solution to this problem. Unlike the east, where you need to own property adjacent to water, a water user under the prior appropriation system may acquire water even if they do not have property that is adjacent. They may take water and apply it to use on their own lands. The prior appropriation doctrine was adopted by the early states in their territorial laws and later in their constitutions and statutes. They did this so that they could facilitate agrarian development of the lands within their boundaries. The prior appropriation doctrine was also recognized in early court decisions, such as that in Coffin v. Left Hand Ditch Company. That's actually a decision that was made by the court that meets in this room where we are today. In Coffin v. Left Hand Ditch Company, the Supreme Court recognized the principle that Western lands are worthless if the people who inhabit those lands are not able to acquire and convey water to their properties. Prior appropriation water rights are recognized in different ways by the different states. They may be recognized either by a court entered water rights decree or by an administrative agency via a permit. Colorado was the first state to use exclusively court issued water rights decrees, such as the one you see imaged in this slide, which is an 1888 general adjudication. A general adjudication is a court action in which several water users will come to the court and they will express to the court their needs for water and they will explain to the court the date at which they first began using those water rights. When a general adjudication decree is entered, that decree recognizes the rights of all of those water users in priority and vis-a-vis -vis one another. Colorado entered several general adjudications in the late 1800s and 1900s and more recently 
Idaho and New Mexico have taken similar approaches in entering general adjudications. More recently in Colorado and some other states, courts enter individual water rights decrees. One commonality across all states is the requirement for beneficial use. When a water user diverts water in accordance with their appropriation, there may be no waste of that water. It is only that portion of their diversion that is beneficially used that they are awarded in their water rights decree, either via court decree or by permit. Another commonality between almost all states is the requirement to use it or lose it. A water user must continue the use of their water or it may become subject to abandonment or forfeiture. Across the different western states, if a water user does not use their water for a period of five to 10 years, depending on the state, then their water right may be lost. They can use water again, but they would have to get back in line in the prior appropriation system. Once water rights have been established by water users on a single river or stream, they are administered via a call on the river system. What you'll see in this first slide is a river with sufficient water to provide all diverting priorities with water. In this slide, the red diversion from the river has an 1880 priority date. It is the most senior water right. The purple diversion farther upstream has a 1950 priority date. It is a more junior water right, and it's the green diversion with a 1980 priority date that is the most junior water right. In the beginning of the season, when snowmelt occurs, a river may be full depending on its location. If this happens, there's enough water in the river to satisfy all priorities. That is what you see in this image, and that is what we like to call free river conditions. All priorities are satisfied, and even water users without priority could take advantage of free river water. What frequently happens later in the season, as snowmelt is coming to a close, river levels may decrease. At this time, there may be a call placed on the river. In this slide, the 1880 priority on the river has had to place a call so that water will reach their diversion point. If they don't place a call, that 1950 diversion would have continued and the 1880 priority would receive insufficient water. But when the 1880 priority places a call, the state administrative agency will manage the river so that the 1950 diversion is no longer in effect. The 1950 diversion further upstream may continue to divert because there is still sufficient water in the river to satisfy both priorities. What can happen later in the season, however, or perhaps during a drought year, may be that there would not be enough water in the river to satisfy all of the priorities at all. In this case, the 1880 water right may place a call, and all water rights diverting upstream of that senior priority will be curtailed. And in that way, the 1880 most senior water right does get the water to which it's entitled. Water rights have several attributes incorporated into their decrees or into their permits, depending on the state. And those attributes must be associated with the water for it to be diverted by a water user. In this slide, you will see a state administrative record. And I don't want you to pay attention to the text necessarily on this document. It's pretty complicated. There's a lot of information. That's all the information about the particular water rights on a single ditch that needs to be administered by a Colorado water agency. The water agency needs to be able to know what are the uses associated with particular water rights in order to make sure that water users are not using water rights for undecreed or essentially illegal purposes. Those attributes include the type of water right, the use of the water, the amount of water right, the amount of the water that is decreed, the place of use, and the priority date. A type of use may include things such as a direct flow diversion through a ditch for use on a field or in somebody's home. It may also include storage either off the stream or on channel using a dam that will store water on a stream channel. And uses of water may also include diversions through wells. There are times at which Underground water is hydrologically connected to a stream. If that's the case, you cannot divert water through a well unless you have a water right. Uses of water in the West are primarily for agriculture or irrigation. Demographics and times are changing, however, and uses that have always existed are becoming more predominant. Those include uses for industrial purposes, domestic, 
and municipal purposes. In addition, in the last 30 years or so, people have begun acquiring water rights for non-consumptive uses. Non-consumptive means you basically, you do not take water out of a stream system, you leave, leave it there. Non-consumptive uses include uses for uh, recreational purposes, such as taking your boat down a stretch of river. You need a certain quantity of water in the river to be able to do that. Other non-consumptive uses include in-stream flows for environmental purposes. Water rights are also constrained by the amount of water decreed to them. The amount of water decreed to a water rate may be expressed in terms of volume or rate. Early decrees focused on one or the other. If you had a storage right, there was a volume associated with that, usually an acre feet. If you had a diversion right, there was a flow rate associated with it, usually in cubic feet per second. Water rates that are issued in decrees or permits today typically involve both of those constraints. Water becomes a more scarce and a tighter commodity all the time as more people are coming to the West and using water. So the uses of water are becoming more and more detailed in decrees. Some decrees now are almost 100 pages long or longer because there are such detailed constraints on the water rights. The amount of water decreed to a particular water right may also be constrained by an amount that may be used that fluctuates over the course of a year. For instance, if a water right is used for irrigation, a farmer may have a decree to use a certain amount during summer months. During winter months, however, the amount of water that can be used pursuant to that decree would drop to zero because there's no need for irrigation during the, during the winter months necessarily. Water rights also include a place of use. The place of use is described by, in some cases, acreage. For instance, a farmer might have a decree to use water rights on specific acreage. If they want to use that same water to irrigate different lands, the water right would have to be changed, or the water user would have to acquire a new, more junior water right. And water rights, of course, also have a priority date associated with them, which is key to operations within the prior appropriation system. Another key component of water rights is water transfers. Water transfers are the ability to transfer water rights from one use to another, or by one user to another user. This is very important to the West as populations and demographics change. Water rights may be conveyed from one user to another user while maintaining their priority date. That is to say, if you acquire a senior water right, but for an entirely new purpose, you can still maintain that senior priority date. It's really important in the West because we have growing municipal centers. They need to acquire water rights. If they could only acquire a junior water right when there was a drought, they would be in big trouble. They wouldn't be able to provide people who live in cities with water. So one very common pattern among water rights these days is for municipalities to acquire senior water rights that were decreed for either irrigation or perhaps industrial use and to change those water rights for their own uses. Water rights are very different from other property rights in that only the amount of water contained within a water right that has historically been used may be transferred to new uses. Another very important component of the transferability of water rights is that they may be conveyed for use in different places. In this slide, you will see that there is a lot of water available on an average annual basis in the western half of Colorado. However, a lot of population growth is towards the center or the eastern portion of the state along the Denver metropolitan area. Therefore, it's really important for water rights that they can be transferred for uses from the west to the east as necessary. However, most western states do have codified in their laws that a water user may not transfer water use out of state. So that is to say, if I'm a Colorado water user, it would be against the law for me to sell my water right to somebody in an adjacent state, such as Wyoming or Utah. I mentioned earlier that most water rights in the Western United States are used for irrigation and agriculture. Another big user of water rights, however, in the Western United States is the federal government. The federal government is a very large landholder in the Western US. As you can see in this slide, a significant portion of our lands are owned by the federal government. The federal government does hold water rights as its property, however, Unlike other federal property, those water rights are determined by state adjudications or state permit processes, depending on the state. The federal government does need to work within the prior appropriation doctrine as it is practiced by each individual state. The priority date of federal reserved rights 
is established upon the date on which the federal land is reserved from state domain. That is to say, if a national park was created in 1910, the priority date for water rights associated with that park will also be 1910. Additionally, the quantity of water that is dedicated to those federal reserved water rights is the quantity necessary for the purposes for which that federal land parcel was reserved. For instance, if you have a wildlife refuge, there would be water rights dedicated to the refuge in an amount sufficient to support wildlife in that area. Native American water rights are established in the same way. They are reserved for Indian reservations at the time that those land reservations are established, as well as for the purposes of the reservation. I hope that I've been able to answer some of your questions about water rights in the West. I also hope that I've piqued your interest so that you have more questions. Thank you so much.